Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Monday, May 15th, 2023. It is great to be back with Professor Paul Asimo. Paul, once again, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Good morning. We're going to reverse time a little bit. There's one topic we should cover before we get back into the chronological narrative, your musical career at Caltech as a graduate student. So we talked about your time at Harvard, all of your involvement in music there. When you came to Caltech as a graduate student, what musical opportunities were there for you to pursue? Uh, so at that point, I had just come from really my whole uh, social life and most of my spare time as an undergraduate being dedicated to the Harvard University Band. And I was entirely a band musician at heart at that point. So when I learned there was a concert band, I went straight for that. Um, at that point, I was a good flute player and piccolo player and a not very good tuba player. Um, and tuba, if I recall, you picked up sort of on a lark just to see if you could do it when you were walking down yeah, to play. And, right, you weren't trained or anything like that. Right, never had a lesson. Um, and the marching band needed tubas. Um, so I think I made the mistake of auditioning for Bill Bing first on tuba and tiring out my lip and then on flute, maybe not sounding as good as I might, I don't know. But um, And who's, who is Bill Bing? Ah, okay, so um, Caltech has had a music program for a long time. It has varied in quality over the years and has kind of bounced back and forth a couple times between the HSS division and student affairs. But in the early 1970s, um, a trumpet player named Bill Bing was hired to direct the concert band and the jazz band and did so for 40 years. Also, his wife Dolores Bing, who is a cello player, um, at least organized for those 40 years the chamber music program, may have founded the chamber music program as far as I know. And was the partnership with Occidental there at the beginning or that came later or even preceded them? I don't know how that began or when it began. Um, when I arrived in 1991, it was definitely the Caltech Occidental Concert Band, a joint group. It was a slightly awkward because Oxy is on semesters and there we're on quarters, and mm -hmm. so the schedules don't quite match up. And the commute can be a little bit of a barrier, but um, it was helpful to us to fill some seats in the concert band with Oxy students, and it was very helpful to them because there was a string orchestra there, but no real performance opportunity for wind players. And would you play there, or they always came here? We would play there. Uh huh. And this is an important angle because Caltech does not have a decent concert hall. Beckman doesn't cut it. Beckman stinks. Okay. Beckman is a lecture hall. It is absolutely useless for music. The stage is not big enough for the full concert band. It used to be the concert band was smaller and could fit on the stage. There's no green room space because the building is a circle, and so yeah. there's nowhere to put it. Um, and there's no way to extend the stage First of all, um, public events won't give up any seats. And secondly, you can't light it or capture the sound in front of the curtain wall without building a truss, and that would wreck the architectural um, look of the interior. So we've tried, and there is no way to rescue Beckman as a concert hall. How are the acoustics? Absent Lousy. All the, they Lousy. Are. So it's a lost cause entirely. Yeah, right. <laughs> you could digitize the acoustics. You can get an array of microphones and send it to a laptop and send it back out and just say, make it sound like the Concertgebouw or make it sound like um, Symphony Hall or yeah. make it sound like Avery Fisher Hall. You can do that, yeah. but only if you can pick up the sound and that right. requires the mics. And yeah. so, um, no, Beckman is no good. Ramo is okay, but it only seats 400 and it's nothing special. Thorn Hall at Occidental is spectacular. Ah. It is a great space acoustically. Purpose built? Yeah. It has plenty of seating capacity and plenty of room on the stage and plenty of backstage space. The problem is it's at Oxy, which is in the middle of nowhere. Nobody can find it. There's no parking. Um, it's You have to walk up and down hills at night. And, and so it has challenges for an audience, but um, part of the collaboration between Caltech and Oxy is we one of our three concerts per year we would perform in Thorn Hall and rehearse in Thorn Hall and if we wanted to record we could record in Thorn Hall um, and that was a valuable resource um, so 
much later would that relationship fell apart for a number of reasons involving politics in the Oxy Music Department and their wish to have to stand on their own feet and have their own music program and not have their students come and participate in ours instead, which is too bad. Um, but at that point, it was definitely a joint operation, which meant something on the order of 10 Oxy students a year would be in the concert band. Um, anyway, um, the Bings were really central to keeping performing and visual arts going at Caltech all the way through the 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, um, and offering a really valuable um, extracurricular opportunity to generations of Caltech students, many of whom are very talented musicians. And the size of the school is such that programs like music um, have this beautiful spirit of amateurism without lack of quality mm -hmm. and um, community involvement in that there's room in the orchestra and in the concert band for not just the undergraduates and not just the music majors, but all the undergrads that want to play and the graduate students and the postdocs and the faculty and the JPL community and the alumni and whoever. Um, so it's a really interesting mixed group and a, really a valuable getaway, I think, for a lot of the students. Mm -hmm. So, and Bill is a good trumpet player and an okay conductor and just a really generous spirit and um, ran a, a group that was fun to be in. Are either of the things be in. still with us? Oh, yes. Know? Yes, absolutely. They retired about eight years ago now. But Glenn Price, the new director of what's now the Caltech Wind Orchestra, he didn't like the name concert band, it wasn't proper enough for him. Um, Glenn hired Bill back as the brass coach. So within the structure of the concert band, there's a music director and then there's a woodwind coach, a brass coach, and a percussion coach. And Bill is still playing in the group, uh, filling in third trumpet parts where needed, and um, coaching the brass section. Uh, Dolores is not active on campus as far as I know, but she's around. She comes to shows. Um, the chamber music program was taken over by its current director, Maya Jasper White, again about eight years ago. Um, and that's a very interesting endeavor also. I never played with the chamber music group, but each quarter they take all comers and have to sort them into trios and quartets and quintets of matched ability and find them literature that is suitable, challenging, but not impossible. Um, and so, you know, you, end up, you start out with a bunch of note cards with, oh, I have 42 violins and six violas, what am I going to do? And, uh, <laughs> so it's an interesting process. Anyway, so it was obvious to me when I, day I arrived here for graduate school that I was going to play in this concert band, so I went and auditioned for Bill. and. Um, did you offer both piccolo, flute, and tuba? I did, and he made the sound choice at that time to put me on flute. Um, did you own a tuba? Did you schlep a tuba out here? I did not at that time own a tuba, because um, in the Harvard band I had just been playing sousaphones that belonged to the band. And here the band owns three concert tubas. Um, and many years later, um, when I was on the faculty and one year there was an excess of flutes and a dearth of tubas, and at that point I had much more experience as a tuba player, and I'd played in the Columbia concert band. Bill asked me to go and play tuba, so I borrowed one of the band's tubas, which needed some work. So I took it to Rob Stewart's brass shop in Arcadia, which is a really fantastic brass shop, and there, hanging on the wall, in perfect condition, was a Miraphone F tuba. And I think Miraphone are the best brand of tubas in the world, and I always wanted to own one if I was going to own a tuba. I never meant to buy an F tuba, which is a little kind of half size tuba, or two thirds size, exactly. Um, but there it was, and the price was right, so I bought it, and I learned to play new, new set of fingerings, this small tuba, and that's been my main instrument ever since. Oh, wow. Um, but no, at that point, um, I did not own a tuba. Um, so I joined the concert band as a flute player. At that point, we rehearsed in the basement of Beckman Auditorium, 
which is not a terribly big room and not great acoustics, but it was available to us year-round. Um, and I made Bill aware of the fact that I knew how to conduct at least a marching band. Um, and so the first quarter I was here, um, as we were preparing that fall concert, we were rehearsing a silly little piece called The Whistler and His Dog, a novelty piece by Arthur Pryor. And it had what musicians call a very complicated road map. Um, like in order to fit the whole piece on one small piece of paper, there are lots of repeats and signs and codas and you have to jump from here to there and there to here. And Bill couldn't figure it out, like where we were supposed to go next. And so I raised my hand, I said, oh, we're well, supposed to go here, 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 here. And he just handed me the stick and he said, you do it. <laughs> 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 and so I conducted that piece on my first concert here in the fall of 1991. And then Bill gave me this incredible opportunity three times a year for seven, for six years to lead whatever piece I wanted with the concert band. Um, and so I became the, the regular standing associate conductor um, as well as playing in the group. And that's a really rare opportunity for an amateur to have a group of musicians that are willing to sit there and watch you wave your arms at them. Mm -hmm. right? um, and it's one of the things that I love about Caltech, right, is had I gone anywhere else, uh, any proper university that's got a, a music program and a surfeit of students that want to play in the top level groups, I wouldn't have been able to conduct. I'm not that good. I'm not professional. I have no real qualifications. Um, but I love it. And here there's room for that. And that's true of theater, and it's true of athletics, and it's true of performing and visual arts, and it's true of all these things on campus that there is a lot of talent, maybe without formal qualifications, and things that people like to do but aren't going to make a career out of. And there's room for people to do them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of my favorite things about Caltech. So um, I've been very loyal to this group all along. Um, by the time I was graduating, um, I think Bill gave me an opportunity to conduct a whole concert and also to do some arranging. Yeah, I was going to ask, was that your entree into musical composition, the conducting? No, I've never really been a composer. Um, but you have done arrangements. I've done arrangements, but that's different, right? Yeah. That's working with existing material and shaping it to fit the size and the ability of the group that you're playing with and trying to make it sound balanced. Um, it's very different from composition, it's easier. Yeah. Um, my... Um, I don't remember if we got into my grandmother and my family history in music. A, a little six, bit. Six sessions ago, but you know, my grandmother was a Yiddish folk musician and she left, or she, she sang all of these Yiddish songs and played them on the piano and my uncle recorded them, uh, recorded her playing them, and I've transcribed them and translated them as well as I can and I have that. And what I had the, was the original recording device, what did he use? Oh, it was a VHS camera. Oh, so it was more. It was more recent. Yeah. Okay. No, it was th this was in the in the late '80s or okay. early '90s, um, and I have I made a start on composing a concert band piece based on the songs and the, the themes from the songs that my grandmother used to sing, um, but it was wildly ambitious. I planned for it to be a quadruple fugue. Um, which formally requires not only finding a way for each melody to simultaneously play contrapuntally in four different voices, but eventually for all of the melodies that you use to be played simultaneously and work together contrapuntally. It's very it's the kind of thing that Bach would, you know, just improvise in front of the king of Prussia for yeah. fun, right? But <laughs> so, <That's real>. <laughs> uh, so I, anyway, um, I didn't ever finish that, and at one point the software that I was using got obsoleted by a change in operating system. And so um, I think I have a hard copy of the start that I made on that piece, but I have not. Then I started having children and things and getting busy at work and haven't gotten around to finishing it. Someday I will finish it, possibly by scaling back the mathematical sophistication of what I'm planning <laughs> to do with it and just write the music. So no, um, composition has never really been my thing, but I've done a lot of arranging. It's part of the responsibility of the uh, student conductor of the Harvard Band to arrange music. So, you know, 
each week during football season, the drill master would say, well, we're going to play this tune at the show next week. We don't have it. Make it. Right? And so the conductor would have a few days to whip up something that might sound good. Um, so again, I got ambitious. And um, while somewhere around my fifth or sixth year of graduate school, um, I've always had a fondness for the music of Charles Ives. And I decided to do a setting of just the last movement of Ives' Second Symphony for a concert band. And I did. And we recorded it, actually. Every now and then, Bill would do a recording project, and we'd put out a CD. Um, so there is, in fact, a recording of the Caltech co Oxy Concert Band playing my arrangement of, of Ives's, the finale of Ives' Second Symphony. Um, it's a very difficult piece of music. It's a very difficult arrangement, but it's a good group. We pulled it off. Um, So, yeah, then I graduated and went off to Columbia. I actually came back um, sometime during my postdoc to play in a concert for the 25th anniversary of Bill Bing being the band director. Um, and then I came back to join the faculty and, of course, immediately rejoined mm -hmm. the concert band, again, on flute or piccolo at that point. Um, so you've kept up with flute and piccolo over the years. Well, I was at that point, but then maybe my second year or third year in the band, I switched back to tuba, and I've pretty much stopped playing flute. Uh -huh. I absolutely stopped playing piccolo because of my hearing. Um, I have terrible hearing, and playing piccolo does not help. It's really loud, and it's really high, and it's right here. Uh -huh. It's probably what triggered my hearing loss um, originally was playing piccolo, and then probably conducting the marching band without hearing protection. Uh, um, and it runs in the family to lose your hearing at some point. Uh -huh. So, um, no, I don't play piccolo anymore. I can still play flute. You know, I would started it early enough and trained it hard enough and practiced enough that it's in muscle memory. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably not as good as I once was, but I can pull the flute out of the case after a year and play it, and I know where all the notes are, and mm -hmm. I can still hit the high notes, and it's fine. Um, but no, I'm really pretty much uh, exclusively a tuba player now. And so I kept playing in the group as a faculty member, and it's, it's good to have some faculty members in the group. One, it's kind of exciting for the students to see professors in some setting other than in lecture and lab, and concert band is, is a, an example of a good place for social interaction between students and faculty that's maybe a little easier than you know going to house dinners and having roles thrown at you. Um, and um, faculty have a certain amount of pull on campus and so as a member of the group and then as a member of a kind of advisory committee that the Vice President for Student Affairs put together under S Professor Steve Frouchy to sort of watch over performing in visual arts. Um, and then as um, advisor to the committee that built the Hamitman Center on how to build a decent rehearsal space with Steve Frouchy's, Steve and Mia Frouchy's money. And then eventually as chair of the search committee for Bill Bing's replacement, I've been able to shepherd the music program in the way that a faculty member can, can a, and a student really cannot. And that's been, I think, a, a significant way that I've been able to contribute. Um, but really, it's just as at a certain level for me. I want to play, and I want to have a place where I can play. And as a tuba player, if you haven't got a band to play with, you haven't got anything. It's not that's like you're right. going to sit at home and <laughs> practice and, and you know and play tuba solo. Although in 2020, I really missed the fact that there were no July 4th concerts, the San Marino. Lacey Park thing didn't happen. It was the pandemic, so I couldn't play in the San Marino Community Band and um, so on. So I just took um, an amp and software that knows all the parts to all the Susan marches, and you can turn them off one at a time, and my tuba, and I sat in my front yard and I played all the Susan marches <laughs> for anyone who happened to walk by. <laughs> um, so occasionally I will play tuba without, without accompaniment. But um, so I kept playing in the group. I kept um, having the privilege, thanks to Bill, of conducting uh, one piece per concert and choosing whatever I wanted to play so I could embark on a, a three-year cycle of um, 
Franz, uh, Franz von Suppé overtures, if that's what I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, as I gained seniority with the group um, and kind of moved from the transient population of students that play for a few years and then leave into the very long-term stable population of people that it's some of whom have been in the group for 40 years. Um, I've made friends with a bunch of members, both the students that come and go and the long-term members, and we've formed spin-off groups, so I also play in an eight-piece traditional jazz band with several members of the group. Um, and Tuba in a jazz band? Yeah, a Dixieland band. Uh -huh. um, tuba is the traditional bass. Right uh, in in that format. I'm thinking format. like a res uh, what, what's it called the Louisiana Restoration Hall. Uh, yeah, Restoration Hall, yeah. New Orleans. Um, yeah, that's the style. Yeah, um, and that's really that's that's a lot of fun. And let me explain how that works. I'm not really a jazz guy. Mm -hmm. I played jazz flute in high school, but I was never really good at it. Never really learned to improvise um, well, and then didn't play jazz at all for. 20 years um, but the dad's band plus one is the name of the group um, all the tunes were arranged by Les Deutsch and if you haven't heard about Les Deutsch as a part of Caltech history you should you should interview him okay okay he's class of 1974 I think or as an undergrad he has three degrees in mathematics from Caltech a master's and a PhD also He's been the organist at every Caltech commencement since he was an undergrad. He's worked at JPL for 42 years and just retired as the senior director of the Interplanetary Network Directorate, which is to say he makes sure that JPL is in communication with all of its spacecraft all the time. Mm -hmm. I think it's accurate to say that he single-handedly saved the Galileo mission by developing the error-correcting code that allowed it to downlink data without a high-gain antenna. Um, but he's also an incredible natural musician, not only on organ, but on everything else. So he plays either piano or cornet in the jazz band. In the time I've been in the concert band, I've seen him play trumpet and baritone horn and clarinet and saxophone and piccolo and tuba, kind of everything except double reeds and piano whenever we need a pianist. And he composes, the band has recorded several of his pieces um, just this weekend, the jazz band played the piece that he wrote for his own retirement from JPL. Um, and so Les is um, a very good jazz musician and um, <laughs> is willing to facilitate making a jazz band sound like they are improvising by writing everything down for the musicians that don't know how to improvise. Mm -hmm. And so all the arrangements that the dad's band plays are are written out um, by less, although there's room for solos for the people that can improvise. Um, and so when originally I started playing in that band, I just followed the chart. Over the years now, the last 10 years or so that I've been in that group, and also the last five years I've been playing in another jazz group, a banjo band that consists of approximately 10 octogenarian banjo players and me on tuba <laughs> as the bass line. They place from the lead sheet, which is to say just the melody and the chords. And so there I'm making up the bass line as I go along, and now I've been practicing doing that for five years. And then coming back to the dad's band, I'm now much more willing to get off the chart and um, make up what I think is, is a good bass line to go with the music. So i um, been able to, to do that because of Les and his ability to, to lead a band and, and help people become jazz players. Um, so anyway, he's a remarkable figure, and if only because of his role as the organist at commencement, but also because of his role in the jazz band, in the concert band, in the musical life of the Institute. Um, he's worth talking to. Okay. <laughs> um, so eventually, it came time for Bill and Dolores to retire, and we put together a big retirement concert for them. We actually rented Ambassador Auditorium, which is a fantastic space. Where is that? It's um, just on the other side of the 710 stub, 
between um, Orange Grove and the freeway at Green. Okay. It's on the campus of what Am Ambassador College or the Worldwide Church of God. Mm -hmm. um, this basically religious organization, I'm not sure I want to call it a cult, um, had a very generous tithing policy that allowed them to acquire a bunch of land in Pasadena and build a college and build a truly first class concert hall with like all the finest building materials, the best marbles and the best um, metals and, and, and it's beautiful. And, and then they changed their tithing policy and couldn't subsidize the operations at the concert hall which was always a losing operation um, and it it's dark most of the time now. Mm. Um, but it's still there, mm -hmm. and it's really a nice auditorium. So we played a concert there, the jazz band and the wind orchestra and the chamber music groups um, for the Bing's retirement. Um, and then we were able to run a search for a new director. Also, at that time, the performing and visual arts group of lecturers, they're not tenured track faculty, they're not in division, they're part of uh, student affairs, they didn't have any leadership the role of being director of PVA was not desirable enough for any of them to want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the vice president for student affairs at the time, Joe Shepard, authorized a search for a director of performing and visual arts who would also be director of the concert band. So that it was a full-time job. Um, not a temporary part-time lectureship and we could look for somebody really good and we got a lot of applications and one was just so far and away more qualified than anybody else there was just no contest this guy Glenn Price whose previous job was director of wind studies at the um, Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music which is you know a professional music school wanted to move to California wanted to get to know people for more than if the couple of years that master's students would spend mm -hmm. circling through the, con uh, the conservatory and applied for this job that seemed to me to be way below him but the committee loved him we brought him out to conduct the band as well as some other candidates and they were like well obviously uh, and so he took the position and um, he's taken the band to a whole new level. He's changed it to the wind orchestra and he's taken it to a whole new level of professionalism and ambition of the programs that we play. Not necessarily more popular with audiences. Bill was very popular with audiences and ran a very kind of mix of classical and pop sort of music that really brought people in. Um, but I think for the musicians, the wind orchestra under Glenn Price has been a um, more enriching and more educational experience. Um, it was a very challenging transition for me because I had been playing basically second tuba because we had a ringer playing first tuba, a uh, tuba student at the um, uh, Zimmer Music School downtown. Is that it? Zimmer? Zipper? Um, Zimmer. Um, what does ringer mean here? Professional. Uh -huh. Like when you have an amateur group but you need to bring in some extra talent uh -huh. um, to make the group work, mm -hmm. you hire a ringer. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this basically tuba soloist, you know, professional quality player, Gabriel Sears, was playing first tuba. So it didn't really matter that much what I played because he was always right and he was pretty loud. And Bill Bing was not that demanding a conductor. And then Gabe applied for the conductor's job and did not get it, and so he left. He didn't want to play in the group anymore after not being hired to run it. Mm -hmm. So suddenly I found myself playing first tuba with a conductor who hears everything uh -huh. and knows whether it's <laughs> right or wrong. <laughs> so that was a big step up for me in my playing uh, at that point. Um, and, and this was as a faculty member? This is more oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is 2016. Okay. Um, Anyway, more recently, Alan Gross, the director of the orchestra, which also used to be a Caltech Oxy joint operation, and he was a tenured professor at Oxy and a lecturer here, he passed away, and we did a search for a new orchestra director that was inconclusive. Um, didn't find anybody we really liked, and so Glenn said, well, I'll do it on an interim basis. Uh, 
and then the pandemic happened. And so four years later, Glenn is still the director of both the concert band and the orchestra, and he has a process in place to replace himself as orchestra director, but it has not reached fruition yet. Now, has JPL, are they, anybody who's interested there, do they come here? Do they have their own self-contained musical program? Nothing big. There may be small-scale groups that are organized around JPL, but um, they are welcome to play in the orchestra and in the concert band and in the chamber music groups here on campus, and I often do. Um, so, yeah, a number of, of, of JPL people have been playing in the wind orchestra or the orchestra for many years. Now, ballpark, how many committed faculty musicians are there at any given time? Two. Two? Yeah. Who's the other? Right now, Austin Minnick, uh -huh. who's a professor of mechanical engineering who plays trombone in the jazz band. Um, as far as, oh, wait, okay, three. <laughs> uh, the other is Julia Greer, of course, from material science. But as a piano soloist, she's not going to spend a lot of time playing with groups. She may have done some chamber music with the students, but she's really a soloist. And yeah. So if the if the orchestra is not willing to dedicate a concert to putting her up front, then she's like I'm not going to play. Right. Um, Historically, is that a small number now? Were there more faculty involved when you were a grad student? No, it's typical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, faculty are busy. There are many demands on their time, and only a few of them find room in their professional and personal lives um, to take advantage of what I think is this incredible resource of being able to play music for life, um, of this kind of music. So. Yeah, there's, there's usually a handful, but it's not much more than that. Um, Miles Pierce played trumpet in the both, I think, the concert band and the jazz band for a couple of years when he was an assistant professor, and then he got busy. Um, Warren Brown uh, is very active and was in the orchestra for many years as a French horn player. Um, but it's, ne it's never been a lot of people. Anyway, I wanted to get all that on the record because I, re great. I really have treasured the ability, the opportunity to play in this group and the way that Bill Bing welcomed me into the group and gave me this opportunity not only to play but to conduct um, and um, Glenn's tolerance <laughs> of my <laughs> continuing <laughs> Um, Clearly, it's enriched your Caltech life in ways that are immeasurable. Yeah, absolutely. Just to close the loop, do you have insight onto the, the Oxy-Caltech breakup, how that came about? Um, never, I didn't entirely understand it. Um, they, the Oxy people, felt very touchy about um, communicating with Glenn after being fairly comfortable communicating with Bill. And they really wanted to strike out on their own and have students focus on oxy-centered activities. Um, and so there were just sort of a series of misunderstandings and miscommunications and n political machinations at oxy that um, eventually just led to a breakdown in the relationship and they mm -hmm. said we're not going to we're not going to participate anymore. But Caltech has been basically okay since that. Has there been a loss from Caltech's perspective? No, because we can always fill seats with community people. Yeah. Right. If we, you know, don't have a bassoon player, we can find a bassoon player. Uh -huh. So, um, no, the group is just as strong without the Oxy students as it was with them, um, except that we don't get to play in Thorn Hall anymore. Right. But that means we don't have to drive over there anymore. Right. So. With the construction of the Hamidman Center and the Frouchy Rehearsal Room, we solved the problem of having a place that is ours to practice that sounds good and that we don't have to clean up after every rehearsal and set up before every rehearsal. Um, that's a big thing. Um, I was um, 
when the Frouchy gift came in and the Habitman Center got off to a planning stage, I went to talk to the committee several times and I said, first the acoustician, then the architect. Yes. First the <laughs> acoustician, then the architect. Don't do it the other way. There are so many lousy performance and rehearsal spaces where the acoustics were an afterthought. Uh, and they heard me, and that's a good space. And I had actually, just because Glenn was busy doing something, I had the opportunity to conduct the first rehearsal in there um, when it was built. Um, so that's a good thing. The rehearsal space problem is fixed. The performance space problem is not fixed. And this has been a long series of disappointments. There was a plan at one point to build a new 800-seat concert hall as part of a campus center back under President Baltimore. Um, where, where would that have gone? Um, maybe where Physical Plant is, uh -huh. kind of north of Brown Dining Hall, um, east of Jorgensen. Um, the um, short was Baltimore supportive of this? Yes, yeah, Baltimore was very interested in arts on campus. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, the there was money in the form of a gift from from Ben Rosen, um, but after a fair amount of dithering and, and exchanges over what was the scope of the project and, and what would be in it and whether it was the best thing to do with the money, um, Stolper eventually redirected the Rosen gift to bioengineering. As often happens on campus, the sure. demands of the science and technology um, and the divisions tend to come first and student affairs and performing and visual arts tend to be an afterthought. So we almost got a concert hall, but didn't. Um, and it's still a challenge. Um, there isn't really a proper theater for Tacit to use that has you know, backstage space and um, above the stage space for sets, and so you there's a limit to the um, ambition of the productions that they can put on. Um, and the concert band is really too big for Ramo to have a, like a 100-piece concert band in a 400-seat hall is sort of unbalanced. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we ought to have a professional quality performance space on campus. We don't, and not clear that we ever will. Well, the next campaign is coming up in a few years. Maybe uh, something will get earmarked for that. Maybe. I doubt it. <laughs> it would be nice. Um, there's also a, a long history of, of um, friction over the use of Ramo between the HSS division, mm -hmm. which controls the building and the performing and visual arts and um, public events offices, which use the auditorium. They just can't seem to get along, which is too bad. That's it for music. Okay. Back to rocks? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we left off last time. You know, you were setting the stage for your research agenda, thinking about joining the faculty, what you would accomplish here. And you emphasized your refusal, seemingly strategically, to be pigeonholed either into computation, lab experiments, or field geology. You wanted to do all of them. Mm -hmm. So that raises the classic question that, that faces every junior faculty member. Whether you are hyper-focused on the thing that you are best at and known at because that's your ticket to tenure, or you want to be broad and diverse and do lots of different things. Both have worked. Both models work at Caltech because of the amazing way that Caltech supports its junior faculty. But if you were self-conscious and not wanting to be pigeonholed, what concerns did you have about going for breadth over depth in those valuable pre-tenure years? Um, I've seen this happen many times, that tracking committees at the midterm review of, of the junior faculty appointment always advise people to focus. And generally speaking, junior faculty ignore that advice and keep doing the things that they're doing because they can see where they're going. And it usually works out well. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure anybody told me I should focus. I don't remember. But I've seen this advice given many times. Um, 
the computational work was already off and running and mature and yielding results at a steady pace. Um, and I knew it was good stuff and I knew I was being recognized for it and I, it was not hard to keep doing it. Experiments are challenging to get going, especially if you're building anything new. And that can take a lot of time before the equipment is working, you find a student that you can train to do it, um, you get some papers out, those papers get noticed. You really have to hit the ground running. I had the advantage of taking over a working lab and then take inheriting another working lab and so being able to get moving with experiments right out of the starting gate. Um, and which of the two was Tom Aaron's? Not the initial one, that came later. Yeah, so initially I got Peter Wiley's space right. with working piston cylinder and um, gas um, pressure vessels and I added the multi-anvil device. There was some spin-up time in getting the multi-anvil device installed and getting it working. Um, I was able to hire a um, postdoc who evolved into a lab manager to keep that, get that thing running and keep it running. Um, Tom Ahrens didn't retire until 2006. Yeah. So there was a kind of gradual transition where even before I arrived, I participated in one of Tom's proposals as a co-investigator. Then when I got here and had PI privileges, we wrote another set of proposals where I was co-principal investigator. And then a couple of years later, it was time to renew some awards, and I stepped up to be principal investigator. And then by the time Tom retired, I was PI of all the awards. So there was about a five or six year transition period there as I became more and more involved in the shockwave lab. So just a counterfactual question, the multi-anvil interest, would that have been part of your research had you not gone to Lamont, do you think? Or was there something so fundamental about your time at Lamont that it steered mm -hmm. you in that direction? Um, the, the capability of the multi-anvil device is to do experimental petrology at higher pressure than the piston cylinder can reach. And the thermodynamic models that I was using to model melting um, are basically calibrated on ambient pressure and gas pressure and piston cylinder experiments and so there's very few experimental constraints beyond um, 2 GPA, maybe 3 GPA, where a GPA is 10,000 atmospheres. Um, so 3 GPA, 30,000 atmospheres, is a depth in the earth of about um, 90 or 100 kilometers. Anything that happens below that we can't model very well, in part because the functional forms that we're using don't extrapolate that well and in part because there's not that much data to support the calibration. So it was clear to me that if I wanted to be able to model melting at higher pressure, which is what happens when the Earth is hotter, either at um, anomalously hot places like Hawaii or Iceland, or in the early Earth when the whole Earth was hotter because it's been cooling over time, we would need to be able to model melting at higher pressure. And if we need to model melting at higher pressure, we need experimental constraints on melting at higher pressure. And so the multi anvil device was a logical place for me to move to so that I could contribute data to the calibration of the models that I use. And I felt, and I actually now that you bring it up, I remember this feeling that simply as a user of experimental data, I was a little bit of a parasite. Like I wasn't contributing to the calibration database, I was simply exploiting the data that were there and I wanted to contribute. Um, and also be able to therefore to choose exactly how to do the experiments and what compositions to work on and what pressure and temperature ranges to work on. So yes, I wanted to, to build the database and not just use it. And one of the clear gaps in the database was that it fell off the deep end at high pressure. So multi-anvil device was a logical place to go. Um, it's one of the reasons that I went to Columbia is we didn't have multi-anvil capability here. Nobody here knew how to do it. I wanted to go and learn how to do it so that I could eventually build that capacity in my own lab. Um, now it turns out that what Dave Walker is known for really is simplifying the multi-anvil device. Um, when he started learning it the traditional way, 
he thought it was really fussy and complicated and difficult and slow. Um, and I think also he had personality conflicts with the person he learned it from at Stony Brook, um, a scientist named Tibor Gasparic. And so um, he turned his brilliance to simplifying the construction of the device and the operation of the device so you could do more experiments more quickly. And I learned the method from him, the simplified, quick and a little bit dirty method. Um, what does that mean, dirty? Yeah. It's not as precise, uh -huh. and it doesn't go to as high a pressure as the as the kind of original method. But it's a reasonable trade-off given the other yeah. benefits. Yeah, it's I don't th and a number of labs still use the, the Walker method. Um, but once I had this lab and um, needed to operate it and had startup money, I hired a postdoc who had trained at the Bayreuth Geo Institute in Germany in traditional multi-anvil technology. And he came here and he's like, I'm not doing that Walker stuff. That's junk. Um, we're doing it right. And so pretty quickly, um, I took my hands off the multi-anvil device and stopped doing the experiments myself and let Jed Mosenfelder, who came as a postdoc, stayed too long to still be a postdoc, and so I had money to hire him as scientific staff. And he event I think he stayed with me 12 or 13 years before moving on to be lab manager at Mark Hirschman's lab at University of Minnesota. Um, by the way, this is something that I keep doing. I hire postdocs and then they don't leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> they become valuable to the operation. I offer them a long-term career as a staff scientist they don't necessarily have the ambition to be faculty members, and so this works well for both of us. Uh -huh. So I think this has happened four times that um, someone has come as a postdoc in my group and stayed for a significant fraction of their career. Um, two of them are still here. Uh, my programmer, who does all the computational in software engineering, Paula Antoshechkina, came as postdoc, never left. Um, Oleg Fatyanov, who came as a postdoc to work with Tom Ahrens and me in the Shockwave Lab, stayed for 15 years before going back to Russia. Um, and Jinping Hu, who is my staff scientist in the Shockwave Lab now, came as a postdoc. Transitioned to staff scientist. You can only be a postdoc for three years. Yeah. So um, <coughs> this, is, this is one of my ways of <laughs> recruiting expertise and then getting long-term professional development to keep complicated experimental and computational jobs going is um, promote. I don't know if it's a promotion or not, but pr postdocs to staff positions, which as long as you can keep raising the money, people can keep doing it forever. When you were thinking about continuing the computational work, so right around this time, I know in the Seismo Lab, for example, Mike Gurness, Jeroen Trump comes here because there's now a new age of high-powered computation for geophysics. Mm -hmm. Were you sort of I mean, it's 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 adjacent, but was that world part of what was exciting to you, the new capabilities of computers and what they could do in, in geo generally? Yes. So um, just the increasing power of an individual workstation, um, you know, where a laptop now is more powerful than a workstation was 20 years ago, sure. right, um, has made the relatively small scale calculations that um, underlie most of what I do, much more efficient. So a calculation that you know used to take 20 minutes now takes 10 seconds, and that's handy. Um, originally, actually, compiling the melts code mm -hmm. on a Spark Station 2 took like four hours. Um, and now it takes five seconds or whatever. Um, but I didn't have, at that time, any um, very many um, really large-scale computing ambitions that would require a, an enormous cluster. We did, in collaboration with Gurness, try to do something pretty expensive, which is do a geodynamic flow calculation where you're following some large part of the mantle and moving material around, and at each grid point and at each time step, you're trying to use the thermodynamic code to calculate the physical state whether it's molten, how molten is it, what are the densities of the phases, um, something that's you know, it's very desirable to do, but it's very difficult because when you're doing small-scale thermodynamic calculations, if the calculation fails now and then, it's not a big deal. You go and you fiddle with it until you get an answer. 
But if you're doing millions of them, they have to all work all the time, every time. And so most of that project was dedicated to finding fixes for the failures in the model. Also, at that time, the, the codes that we had, the, the thermodynamic code <coughs> and the geodynamic code, didn't really talk to each other internally at code level. So one would write out files, the other one would read in the files, write out files, the other one would read in the files. And that's, that's slow and inefficient um, and limits your ability to parallelize the code and really take advantage of a big computer. So we did some of that, and we had a student, Laura Hebert, who wrote a successful thesis of doing that kind of work and went on to do a postdoc um, in that kind of work. But um, I wasn't really involved in designing the first generation of large, um, of the large cluster that, that Trump led the construction of. Um, I was just a, a user once it was here. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of things did you use it for? What was valuable to you? Well, so I used it for that attempt to um, merge geodynamics and thermodynamics uh -huh. in Laura Hebert's work. Um, and then um, over the last, mm, I don't know, 15 years now, I've started dabbling in density functional theory and molecular dynamics and expensive um, nanoscale calculations as mm -hmm. opposed to expensive geological scale calculations. So um, thanks to the N Nobel Prize winning work of the computational chemists like Walter Cohn, um, we have density functional theory, which is an almost, almost exact recasting of the Schrodinger equation that is practically solvable for many electron problems. Mm -hmm. um, whereas like, from the pure physics point of view, it becomes very difficult to exactly solve the Schrodinger equation for a system that's of any interest much larger than a hydrogen atom. Mm -hmm. But computational chemists can do anything these days with some approximations. Um, but the more atoms you need in your calculation, the more expensive it gets. And if you're studying liquids, as I do, they're not periodic, so you can't just represent them with a small unit cell full of atoms and then fill space and say you've calculated everything. You have to have a lot of atoms and their behavior is time dependent at fairly long time scales. Kind of if you watch a solid for long enough for all the atoms to vibrate a couple of times, you've learned everything and you can just extrapolate that through all of time. But in a liquid, the atoms are wandering around and diffusing, and especially at low temperature, you may have to watch it for a milliseconds, seconds, hours <laughs> to actually capture all the behavior. Uh, so that makes liquids challenging for these methods, but liquids are what I'm interested in. So uh, especially in collaboration with Bill Goddard from chemistry, whose specialty really is not doing the quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. right? Using just enough quantum mechanical calculation to tune an empirical function that predicts the forces between the atoms, and then using that empirical function to do the molecular dynamics and follow lots of atoms for lots of time without having to do the quantum mechanical calculation all the time. That's, that's how Bill has succeeded in all the things that he does. It's a natural way to study the problems that I want to study. Nevertheless, those calculations require a fair amount of computing power. And so um, I have had several students who have focused on um, either density functional theory for solids or small liquid systems or um, empirical molecular dynamics for larger liquid systems. It's a, a fair fraction of my activity these days mm -hmm. um, because there is a limit to what we can do with experiments. There are conditions that we cannot get to. There are things that we cannot measure. And the um, calculated, the computational chemistry, the atomic scale or quantum scale computational chemistry lets us fill in the gaps or figure out what we don't know. It doesn't quite, in my view, stand on its own yet. We still need the experiments. The computational chemistry can't put the experiments out of business because there are approximations in the computations. Some of those approximations are convergent. That is to say, the bigger your computer is and the more money you're willing to spend on computational cycles, the closer the calculations approach truth. But some of them are not convergent. It doesn't matter how big your computer is, the, the calculations are just wrong. Someday, 
somebody will figure out an exact solution to the electron exchange correlation potential, which is the missing piece of density functional theory. And then it might be true that the computations will put experiments out of business because you can compute anything exactly. We're not there yet. So, But it's still a simulation. It's still a simulation. It's called an ab initio simulation if you're doing the quantum mechanics, meaning it doesn't depend on experimental input. It predicts everything just from first principles. But it doesn't predict everything right because we don't have an exact solution um, to the equations. So um, I recently had a student um, that worked with me and with Bill Goddard that um, her work is a nice model for the way I approach these problems. Um, she used a small set of ab initio molecular dynamics calculations where you actually solve the density functional theory to get the atomic trajectories. Used those as a basis for tuning an empirical force field so that we could do larger scale calculations with more atoms for more time and get better precision, less noise and less scatter in the simulations. And we studied those results to find simple functional forms that would, to which we could fit sparse and imprecise data. So from the shockwave experiments, we can only do so many experiments, and there are uncertainties in the experiments. And if you try to fit them to very complicated functional forms with lots of parameters, you end up overfitting. You end up fitting the noise rather than the signal. Or you just don't have enough constraints to fit this, the parameters at all. So we need simple functional forms that have very few parameters that we can constrain from the experimental database. So we use the simulations, look at their systematics, try to abstract simplified but robust functional forms from them, and then we fit that to the experimental data. So at, th at that point, we essentially throw away the simulations. The fit to the data are no longer the same as the simulation there because the, all the parameters are refit. But the functional forms we use were inspired by the internally consistent set of simulations. I find this to be a constructive way forward to optimally use sparse experimental data to extrapolate to conditions where I don't have experiments and to optimally use simulations that aren't right but they're nevertheless instructive and they're internally consistent in their own little world um, which kind of gets harkens back to what Ed and I were doing mm -hmm. years ago where we know melts isn't right but it's thermodynamically rigorous and the systematics are robust so even if you're offset from experimental reality, you can still look at how things depend on each other and gain insights, which you can then hopefully port to a model or an experimental database which is accurate, but understand what's going on in between the experimental points using the insights you gain from the theory. That's how I use a combination of experiments and theory to gradually make progress gain insight into the relations and the underlying systematics, gain accurate constraints, but sparsely distributed and put them all together. So that's one of the things I'm using big computers for mm -hmm. these days is quantum simulations. And meanwhile, we are ready to have another go at large scale combined geodynamic and thermodynamic calculations because Paula, my programmer extraordinaire, who's been with me now for almost 20 years, has created an interface uh, where large-scale codes for, comp for geodynamical calculation, if they're written in Python or MATLAB, can directly access MELTS calculations without having to write out a bunch of files and read them back in, which is much more efficient in terms of time and memory allocation and can more gracefully handle failures, and so um, it's time to, to do that again. So um, Gurness and I have a postdoc now, Chan Yuan, uh, who wants to do this kind of thing, and we've written a proposal to actually do it. So this will be the first time in about 15 years that we've really taken on this kind of coupling to do a big joint problem. And that will be a pretty expensive calculation. But the way parallel computing has evolved, we don't have the GPS cluster anymore. We merged it into the high-performance cluster mm -hmm. in the center of campus. 
and for this, it turns out to be better to run it on an NSF cluster where you don't ha you don't have to pay for the computer time at all if you have NSF funding. Mm -hmm. One of the other big transitions when you join the faculty is just the internet and connectivity. How did that affect your research in terms of access to data, sharing data, not having to go to a library if you want to look something up? Hard to say because um, I didn't do that much work in the pre-internet era. Um, certainly, um, yeah, I mean, it, it enormously facilitates communication with co-authors and the building of collaborations. Um, to not have to go see people in person. But there isn't a or worldwide data network for you to tap into or to contribute to in your field? <laughs> that would be facilitated by yeah, the yeah, internet. Yeah, yes, th 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 there is. Um, this is a whole discussion about what is, what is data. <laughs> <laughs> and what are, how do you make repositories how do you convince people to put stuff in repositories and how to do so in a way that it's actually useful. And the whole question of what's right. proprietary. And so, um, yes, big discussion. Some fields, there are universally agreed upon formats for data and all the data goes into the repositories and everybody knows how to get it, right? So uh, seismologists can just download seismograms from any seismometer in the world these days and, well, I'm sure there's some that are <laughs> that are not shared, but many, many, many <laughs> seismometers, and uh, get going on the data right away. And it's just you know, velocity of the seismometer versus time in an agreed upon digital format, and everybody knows what to do. Um, geochemical data have taken longer to get to the um, level of usability where there are large databases and where. Um, you know what the information in them means, and you can use it. Um, I look with actual skepticism on a lot of the work that people do with these databases. You know, once you create a database and you put 100,000 rocks in it, it's very tempting to download all 100,000 rocks and try to look for the systematics of, of all rocks. And we have here, amongst the Petrology faculty, loosely speaking, um, Stolper's group, my group, Farley's group, Eiler's group, Rossman's group, a petrology reading group. Every Friday we get together and we read a paper from the recent literature and we talk about it. And we read a bunch of these kind of large database papers with people collecting vast numbers of samples. And this led me to formulate um, what has become known within the context of this group as Asimov's second law. So Asimov's first law was formulated by my father, who was trying to get bikes off of a bike rack. It's that if the hook on a bungee cord can catch on something, it will. <laughs> um, but Asimov's second law is that in any publication, the amount of thought that goes in per sample is inversely proportional to the number of samples. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Right, um, and the really good papers are the ones that manage to beat Asimov's law uh -huh. and put more thought per sample than is typical. Uh -huh. um, anyway, so yeah, there are papers that have lots and lots and lots of data and don't understand what any of it means because they haven't had the time to stop and look at the individual data points and assess whether they're accurate and whether um, <coughs> they mean what they say they mean. So um, even more challenging is to make a database for experiments in petrology because there's so much metadata that has to go along with the data for you to understand whether the experiment is good and whether it reached equilibrium and what it means and which phases are present and how they were analyzed and what are the uncertainties. It's a difficult database problem to even describe a format into which you can put that information and then get it out and without having to go back and read the paper. So Mark Yorso, the creator of MELTS, 
um, with Mark Hirschman and Tim Grove, who's a petrologist at MIT, um, built such a thing called the Library of Experimental Phase Relations, or LEPR, and wanted it to be a standard where everybody who was writing experimental petrology papers would upload their data to LEPR as they published. It was a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of open science mandates from funding agencies, which typically now require you to do stuff like this. If you're going to use government money and you're going to create data, you have to put it in a public repository. Um, and so nobody really got into the habit of actually putting their information in LEPR. So they had this big burst when they created it of putting legacy data in, all the data that were available up until 2005 or something, but nobody's been maintaining it. So when we contemplate calibrating new models or extensions to melts, LEPR is the logical repository from which we should draw the experimental database that we're going to use for the calibration. Mm -hmm. And Paula has put a great deal of effort into making this pipeline work where we can pull information from LEPR and use it in a calibration. But it's also fallen to Paula to actually, and to our students, to actually put the information in LEPR if the experiments have been done in the last 15 years, because nobody else is doing it. So um, these kinds of things could be done better, but they take work and um, that means pretty much if funding agencies and editors are not mandating <laughs> that you need to put your data somewhere that is accessible, people don't. I think we're looking at a, an ongoing culture shift where people are accepting that this is what you have to do and will start doing it. But um, data management plans from most of the funding agencies have only recently started to get serious. The White House Office of Science and Technology Policy has this year put out a memo that says we're serious about this mm -hmm. and um, there will be changes in behavior. But um, database science in my field has not mm -hmm. yet really lived up to its promise. Mm -hmm. The experimental databases are not universal and portable enough to use without a huge amount of legwork and the analytical databases um, are handy but have tended to be used in ways that are not all that rigorous. The other thing that's coming down the pike is applying machine learning to these databases, which means even less thought per sample mm -hmm. from a human perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and some of that will be good and some of it will, right. be, will be junk. We'll see. So the, the, the stories that I've heard from junior faculty, as I alluded before about Caltech's amazing way of supporting its, its, young, its newest faculty members, there's a feeling of shock when they're asked, what do you need to get your lab up and running? And it's just like, we'll give you what you need. What do you need? Yeah. Which is jarring in the sense that there isn't so much of a, a, a boundary to, that you know you're working in to say, okay, well, within this, this is what I really want. For you, inheriting Wiley's lab with only the, the major addition of the multi-anvil device, did you sidestep that intellectual process of wondering what you needed, or did you go all in on this one device because you knew how much resources could be directing your, directed your way? I think I was a relatively cheap hire, uh -huh. right? Um, compared to several of my colleagues that started around the same time that built very large new labs with all new stuff. Right? Um, so I didn't negotiate very hard because I didn't want all that much. Also, I, I'm not sure I really grasped the scale of what I could ask for. Yeah. But I was negotiating with Ed Stolper, who had been my <laughs> thesis advisor and was then chairman when I was hired, which was changed the nature of the negotiation. And also, Strategically, perhaps, I'm in the unfortunate position of it is obvious that I love Caltech. It is obvious that I am deeply loyal to the institution. It is obvious that I'm never going to leave <laughs> and that I was going to come here even if they didn't make me a particularly good offer. Mm -hmm. It's not a good uh, standing from which to negotiate <laughs> aggressively. Yeah. Right. So, um, no, it, it, the, ne the startup negotiation was not especially aggressive. I figured out what I wanted, I asked for it, I got it. I probably could have asked for more, but whatever. Um, 
And was the fact that it was only the multi-anvil device, the other devices in the lab, they were good as is? You didn't need to do upgrades, you didn't need to add to them? Yeah, they're okay. I'm still using one of them. Um, 23 years later. The other one was leaky and I junked it and made it extra room in the lab. Um, no, what I was going to say is the thing that is distinctive about Caltech in this regard, I have come to realize there are two things. One, there's a lot of resources available. The general budget and the endowment support spending enough money to allow people to do what they need to do. But the other thing is the priority is in the right place, that when we do have resources, we direct it to the junior faculty. Mm -hmm. um, I was shocked, taken aback, some years later when I got tenure and Charlie Langmuir, who had been my postdoc advisor at Columbia and had then moved as a senior hire to Harvard, he said, what are you going to do with your tenure bonus? My reaction was, what is a <laughs> tenure bonus? <laughs> and once I understood what it was, I'm like, why would you do that? If you have money, don't give it to the tenured faculty, give it to the junior faculty so that they'll get tenure. Um, it's part of our system that I know exists in this division, and I suspect across the institute, that when we hire junior faculty, we hire them with the intent to give them everything that they need s to succeed and become tenured faculty. That's our job as senior faculty, is to uh, mentor and cultivate the next generation. And I get the sense that at other institutions that's not so true. You hire junior faculty on a trial basis, and if they don't succeed, you throw them away and hire new junior faculty. Um, and we don't do that. As a result, we're very careful, maybe too careful in our searching. It can be really slow to hire anybody yeah. because we want to make sure somebody's a superstar before we get into the position of maybe having to deny tenure to them someday. Mm -hmm. um, but once we do commit to someone, we really commit. And I certainly value that. I certainly experienced that as a junior faculty member. I got everything I wanted, and I felt like I was not on trial, like they were hoping I would fail or wondering whether I would fail. They were there to cultivate and nurture and mentor me and see that I succeeded. And now that I'm on the other side, I think this is my job. To the extent that I get to direct resources, which is not that much because I'm not the chair or the director of any institute or anything like that. Um, but when you know we have, for example, um, the prize postdocs and the option postdocs, where we have one year of support for a postdoc, anybody can mentor the postdoc. But if it comes down to a tie in terms of the quality of the candidate and the quality of the proposal between somebody who's going to work with a junior faculty member and somebody who's going to work with a senior faculty member, the junior faculty member wins. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what that money is for, mm -hmm. it's to help people get going. Um, speaking of which, the hard money postdocs, I mentioned this before in the context of applying for postdoc yeah. and what kind of postdoc you want. From the point of view of a faculty member, the fact that Caltech has funding for lots of hard money postdocs is really useful because I very rarely think, oh, okay, I'm going to write, uh, you know, a postdoc salary into my grant to do this particular thing, then I'm going to get the money six months after I write the grant, and then I'm going to try to hire somebody to do that. Ugh. I would much rather have somebody talented apply for one of our prize postdocs, get a year of hard money, then they're here and we can talk and say, what do you want to do? That's a good idea. Let's write a proposal to fund your second and third year. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a much better model. Mm -hmm. And it's only possible because we have the Texaco Fellowship and the Earl Fellowship and the Option Postdocs and the Bar Fellowship and um, all of these sources of funding that allow us to bring in a postdoc before we've written the grant to fund the postdoc. Better. The multi-anvil device, was that sort of an island within Wiley's lab? In other words, when you look at Wiley's lab, did it need the multi-anvil device to complete it in terms of its intellectual purview, or you would have brought that in no matter whose lab you inherited? Um, Peter's emphasis was on crustal petrology, things that happen at depth in the earth but relatively shallow by my standards. Um, he 
didn't need to extend his experiments beyond about, say, 3 GPA. Because that just wasn't the kind of problems he was working on. Mm -hmm. I wanted to work on deeper mantle problems. I needed the multi-anvil device. But at the same time, I also work on low pressure problems. And so I like having access to the full range of capabilities from one atmosphere up to multi-anvil pressures. Um, so if I hadn't taken over Peter's lab, in addition to buying and installing a multi-anvil device, I probably also would have bought and installed a piston cylinder device and a rapid quench cold seal apparatus for 0.1, 0.2 GPA kind of pressures. Um, and then I've been able to take advantage of being on the same floor as Ed Stolper in his lab to not have to build my own one atmosphere gas mixing furnaces, which are very useful for things that don't require the application of pressure, but just high temperature, accurately known temperature, and controlled chemical environments. Because John Beckett and Mike Baker have kept that lab, that lab in tip-top shape for all these years and allowed me to walk in and use it whenever I want. So the third floor of arms here with the Stolper labs, the Rossman labs, and my labs, it's all, I mean, somebody owns every room, but it's all effectively shared space. We uh -huh. all go in and out of each other's rooms all the time. At one point, all the Stolper tools were point painted with blue and yellow stripes, and all the Wiley tools were painted with green and yellow stripes so that things would eventually make their way back to the right room. The advantage of this is... Wait, what are your colors? I, I never really made up a color. <laughs> um, the advantage of this is that I've been here long enough, I know where everything is, um, and I can hack together a <laughs> an apparatus to a, to a MacGyver essentially anything <laughs> that needs doing. The disadvantage is I can't do anything with it going in and out of six different rooms. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, but yeah, the it, it's a this shared facility is extremely useful for accomplishing lots of jobs and being able to make up a new experiment without too much planning because there's so many spare parts sitting around. All right, so the, the last topic we'll cover today, we, we talked about computation, we talked about instrumentation and lab work. When you got hired as a faculty member here, what opportunities were there in, in, in field work and in being a field geologist? How did you want to pursue that right out of the gate? Didn't have any plans to do that right out of the gate, right? So I was hired as a professor of geology, assistant professor of geology and geochemistry because my degree is in geology from here. Right. <laughs> so it made sense. But um, all my research agenda um, was focused either on computations or experiments or going to sea and actually picking up glass from the Mid-Ocean Ridge. So, so you continued that work well, from here. Well, I started that relationship with Langmuir at Columbia and a few years after I got here, I was invited to participate in a research cruise and do that. Um, and this was summers, mostly? No, that, that um, the cruise that I went on was in the fall um, in 2004. Um, and it was just a one-off thing. I did that once, it was really interesting, a really different lifestyle to be out at sea for 36 days um, and not, you know, have to commute to work and not have to get your kids to school and not have to cook your own food and just do your shift, get enough sleep. Um, really interesting, different kind of lifestyle and I enjoyed it for that month, um, but I haven't gone back to do it again. So field work was a thing that I did apart from that one cruise, really just for teaching um, purposes, to inspire students to appreciate the earth and wha what you can learn by going out and looking at things. I didn't really do any field-based research for a lot of years. Um, and then a couple of things happened. Um, first, collaborators started coming to me who had done field work at some place in the world and had interesting samples, but either needed my expertise to model what those data meant or needed the analytical facilities that we have here and ready access to to analyze the rocks they brought back and generate the data, which could then be modeled. Um, and so every now and then, 
somebody will write to me and say, can you help? This is my research project. And most of the time I have to say no, but sometimes I say yes. So maybe 20 years ago now, a PhD student in Greece uh, named Yanis Baziotis uh, asked for help modeling his rocks from Greece. And they were interesting rocks. and. He had at least made a start, and I was able to help him, and that's turned into a 20-year friendship and relation, professional relationship now. Um, he finished that work. He finished his degree in Greece. There were no professional opportunities in Greece. It was one of their periodic um, economic crises at the time. Uh, he applied for a postdoc with Larry Taylor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, doing media riddics. Well, actually. Taylor was mostly into meteorites, but he was also working on um, igneous rocks from Earth, and he needed a postdoc to do that. And I wrote a very strong letter, and Larry Taylor called me up and said, what's with this Greek guy? And I said, he's good, hire him, and he did. <laughs> and that helped, actually, Basiotis move into meteoritics, which is most of what he does now. Um, and um, it's been, that's been a very fruitful collaboration and friendship. And again, it started with, you know, he, he had the temerity to email me and say, I'm trying to do these melts calculations and they're not working, can you help? Um, and then in 2014, an Egyptian geologist, Mokhlas Azer, wrote and said, I've got money from the U.S. Agency for International Development to do a postdoctoral visit to the U.S., would you host me? Turns out, by the way, that this is still an ongoing echo of Camp David. We send more money to Egypt than we otherwise would, and yeah. it sponsors things like professional exchanges of scholars. Um, so Azir came here, and turned out his spoken English was abominable, and we couldn't communicate in person at all. Um, so I just said, all right, you brought these rocks. Let's analyze them, and then take the data home and analyze it, work it up, and write the first draft of a paper, and we'll communicate in writing. And that's worked really well. We have like 30 papers now. Wow. Um, and so I've become one of the foremost experts on the geology of the Arabian Nubian Shield, which outcrops in the eastern desert of Egypt between the Nile and the Red Sea, and also on the other side in Saudi Arabia. Just because Azir does all this field work, he picks up all these rocks, he sends them to me, and I analyze them, and he writes up the first draft of the paper, and then I edit it and put in some modeling, and um, and we publish it. They aren't all the greatest papers, but um, that whole thing got going just because I said yes to this offer to host him. Um, I haven't been to Egypt yet. I was going to go in 2020. I haven't spun around to doing that again. Um, but from this experience, I started to get this feeling like, okay, I'm working with all these field geologists. I'm analyzing all these rocks in the laboratory. Meh, I should go <laughs> get my boots on the ground and see these places, see what I'm missing by just waiting for somebody to send me rocks. Um, and so um, in 2017, I guess, um, I happened to mention to a postdoc here, Forrest Horton, that I had looked out the window of an airplane while flying over Baffin Island in Arctic Canada and seen a perfectly circular lake that might be an impact crater. He said, that's cool, let's go. So we wrote actually a grant to, the na to National Geographic. It's not one of my usual funding agencies mm -hmm. by any means, but they thought this seemed cool to get a helicopter and go out to this site um, on a headland between a couple of fjords in Baffin Island and see if it's an impact crater or not. And then, meanwhile, Forrest got hired as an assistant scientist at Woods Hole, and as part of his startup package there, he got more money from them to extend the expedition because within helicopter range from the site of this putative impact crater is an outcrop of rocks that are really famous amongst geochemists because they appear to have the purest sample of the geochemistry that we associate with the lower mantle of the Earth of all the rocks on Earth, these basalts on Baffin Island appear to be the, the purest samples of lower mantle. That's kind of neat, cool. So we had enough helicopter time for eight days, four to go see this impact crater, and four to sample these basalts. 
Um, and so Forrest and Joe Biasi, a grad student here, and I went up there in 2018 during the very short summer season between when the snow melts and when it starts snowing again. We got to the impact crater site and it was obvious within hours that there was nothing to see. It was just a round lake. <laughs> Complete waste of time. <laughs> Beautiful place, not an impact crater. But then we had seven and a half days to really do a good job sampling these um, geochemically interesting basalts. And everybody else who'd ever gone there arrived by boat and had to walk all the way up the hill and carry the rocks all the way back down. So they mostly just picked up rocks from the bottom of the cliffs out of place. We had a helicopter so we could put down on the top of every hill and fill our backpacks with samples stratigraphically controlled, shielded from cosmic rays. Really nice sample collection. We're still working on that. Um, and it was while sitting out on this island looking across the Labrador Sea towards Greenland as the icebergs go by um, with our Inuit man with his rifle um, looking out for polar bears that I remembered really why I became a geologist in the first yeah. place. I'm like, yeah. this, this is, is the life. <laughs> I would love to do more of this, get out of the lab as much as I can. Um, and so another of these students that every now and then somebody writes to you and says, you know, I need help. There was a PhD student in Cameroon in West Central Africa, Jonas Takuju Wambo, who wrote to me and said, I have this rare opportunity. Most of southern Cameroon is covered by meters of soil. It's very deeply weathered. You can't see the bedrock. Um, but they're building a dam, and they've excavated all the, bed all the soil away and exposed the bedrock for now. Then they're going to build the dam, and they're going to flood it. It's going to be gone. And this is, these are the rocks there, and this is what we can see. But I'm, we'll need help to analyze the rocks in order to make sense of this outcrop. And I thought it seemed like a really worthy project. So I started collaborating with him. Again, he sent me the rocks. We analyzed them here. I sent back the data. Then there was this tragedy where there, because they were also looking for gold, bandits came in and took everything from their lab uh -huh. and their homes, all their hard drives, all uh -huh. their computers. But I had backups of everything oh here, good. so I was able to <laughs> rescue his thesis. Um, and then he finished. And also in Cameroon, everything is connections and not talent, and he couldn't get a job. Mm. And we have these hard money postdocs. And the person that we offered the geochemistry postdoc to turned it down, and so we were kind of off schedule. And I swooped in and I said, OK, this is unusual, but I would like to hire this postdoc from Cameroon to come here. And my colleague said, oh, OK, that sounds like a good thing. So we did. And his project started with field work in Cameroon. So I said, I'm going. <laughs> I want to see the place. I want to participate. It made the expedition much more complicated and expensive to um, take a white guy, a white vegan guy, out into the far outback of Cameroon. Um, we had to have armed guards from the army. We had to have a cook from the capital. Um, we had to have professional drivers, but that was a really cool expedition, and we picked up a bunch of rocks, and Jonas is here, and we're working on them now. Um, so I would love to do more of this kind of stuff, either in collaboration with geologists around the world or just because we think of a place that would be cool to go. Um, field geology is fun, but it's also hard to take the observations that you can make, you know, just with eyes or with a drone or by picking up rocks and learn something really new and original, you at some level can have a much bigger impact by doing theory or by doing experiments that in principle apply to any terrain in the world than you can by working on one particular terrain unless you choose your places to go very carefully to be the best example of something. But I have the time and leisure to do all these things, and so that is my goal. All right, so last that. question for today. So as a junior faculty member, you were focused on computation and lab experiments, not yet on field geology. It does raise the question, does that mean that you were working on samples from other field missions, or were there aspects of your research that didn't require samples at all, that were divorced from the physicality of finding rocks and analyzing them? Yes, 
at first mostly that, mm -hmm. that the thermodynamic calculations are rooted in experiments <coughs> and they can be used to interpret rocks, um, but they can also be used to interpret processes that are pretty far divorced from the rocks. If we're trying to understand things like the moon forming impact and the melting of the whole mantle and the crystallization of the magma ocean, and these very large scale, very long ago processes for which there aren't any samples, part of doing the theory is figure out does the theory eventually make a prediction that is specific enough that there might still be evidence of it on the Earth to go and pick up, right? Maybe no, and it might le be less satisfying if the theory is never really testable. But you have to have the theory to figure out what the tests might be before you can do the tests. Sure. Um, so, you know, a lot of the work that I was doing, mm. let's say, after the after I published everything that I started while I was a postdoc, dealing with mid-ocean ridge basalts, and before I started working on the rocks from Greece and Egypt and Africa, in between the 10 year period or so there, it's very much separated from any actual rocks because it was mostly about the deep mantle and the deep mantle is inaccessible. Except by geophysical measurements, which is very different from picking up rocks. On that note, next time we'll pick up in the in the narrative um, when you came up for tenure and what what case you made at that point, what your contributions were, and then the process of being more involved in Tom Aaron's lab and then ultimately taking it over. So okay. we'll pick up on those two, and if they're interrelated, we'll cover that as well. Uh, yeah, but we should also get to um, the non-research stuff that I have done. Um, in terms of um, committees that I've been involved in, student housing, freshman admissions, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the GPS division. A lot of my time and effort goes into things that have affected and will affect the history of the Institute that aren't exactly research. I wonder if, just thinking chronologically, if a lot of those administrative interests and responsibilities came after tenure, or you even did some of those things as, a, as an assistant professor. Um, we try to spare our assistant professors overwhelming um, administrative work, but we do sit on some committees, both in the division and in the institute, and may gain some leadership and some influence, um, as long as it's not taking too much of your time. Okay. Research and administration yeah. measures next Good time. Time. <laughs> Very good.